free play of the faculties intimates a propositiveness that cannot be rendered conceptually determinate. So let's return to the striking claim in Hegel that art has become for us ein Vergangenes, a thing of the past, not capable of functioning with the power and importance it once had. Of course, by claiming this, Hegel did not mean that art will not be produced or enjoyed, or that it will somehow be discredited as a primitive form like alchemy or astrology, or that it will come to seem a primitive form of philosophy. We should just stop doing it and do philosophy. It didn't mean anything like that. <coughs> to understand what he means, we have to recall that Hegel's treatment of art itself in whatever period had already throughout the lecture seemed fairly throughout the lecture, steered fairly clear of many of the traditional aesthetic categories. When he's discussing the notion of true beauty, for example, he says such unusual things as, works of art are all the more excellent in expressing true beauty, the deeper is the inner truth of their content and thought. This is not a form of classicism, because Hegel does not consider artworks to be representations of an independent objective ideal the truth in the normal sense, but as we shall see in more detail, as vehicles for the practical realization of the relevant speculative truth. Partly this is because of what he believes about the unique logical status of self-knowledge, even at the collective or civilizational level. And this is another theoretical presupposition of the lectures <coughs> that requires much too brief a summary. Whether as collective or individual, self-knowledge does not take an object in the usual intentional sense, according to Hegel. What we take ourselves to be is as much an avowal or commitment of what we shall be, a pledge about what we will keep faith with, and not a simple self-recognition of some objective status. Self-knowledge is self-constituting in Hegel. As we collectively struggle actually to become who we take ourselves to be. This feature of self-knowledge has an even more important implication. Here is the passage where Hegel distinguishes himself from traditional classicism in the clearest terms. He is discussing classical art here, naturally the favorite period for classicist theories, and he notes something about the way classical art should be said to reveal the truth. What he says here is extremely important, for it not only distinguishes his position from traditional classicism, but he is relying on the same logical structure in understanding the expressive and actualizing function of artworks as he does in understanding the relation between subjective mindedness and deed, a connection we will soon see crucial to his approach and connected to the problem described above as the idealist problem of the absolute. And it was not as if all these ideas and doctrines were already there in advance of poetry, in an abstract mode of consciousness, as general religious propositions and categories of thought, and then later were only clothed in imagery by artists and given an external adornment in poetry. On the contrary, the mode of artistic production was such that what fermented in these poets, they could only work out in this form of art and poetry. There's herausarbeiten again. There's a great deal more to say about that very interesting phrase, herauszuarbeiten. For one thing, this way of talking makes clear why Hegel might think that the externalization of our ideas about ourselves in artworks is essential, not merely exemplifying. We don't know in any determinate or living detail who it is we take ourselves to be, except in such externalization, either in action, what we do, or in some material production. As he says, there are no ideas or doctrines before their realization in art, but only in art, which is a hard doctrine to grasp intuitively. It seems very natural to think they have to be there before. As he says, there are no ideas or doctrines first, before, but only in. As just noted, in the case of individual self-knowledge, this knowledge is inherently first and not third personal and is not observational, but is self-constituted cannot be a mere self-discovery or self-report in any significant sense beyond a report of empirical facts, the sense relevant to our practical identity. As when we say something like, what I am is a practicing Christian or an atheist or a political liberal 
or a devoted father. That's not an observational report. That's a commitment that is real, only if realized in a way in what we do. That's where it's what it is. That's the model for what he's talking about, about the centrality of art in self-knowledge. I say this is true, what we are is what we do provisionally, because Hegel adds to this self-constitution notion the claim that such avowals are real, wirklich, only when they are finally realized, verwirklich, in a world at a time. He agrees with Goethe that im Anfang war die Tat, in the beginning was the deed, that the deed is in the beginning, im Anfang, not second. In the beginning was the deed, and the deed is the measure of the genuineness and indeed the true content of the subject's commitments. Secondly, when Hegel notes that in our age, art invites us to intellectual consideration, and that not for the purpose of creating art again, but for knowing philosophically what art is, he is not only himself undermining his own account of art appreciation as essentially intuitive and affective. He could easily also be taken to be introducing the possibility of a different sort of art up to these new expectations, more explicit and self-conscious and not just cataloging our expectations and needs. Moreover, Hegel also notes that the situation of the modern artist, by which he means, basic, he means basically late romantic art, has liberated the artist from the burden of any dependence, finally, on a received national or artistic tradition. And Manet is very conscious of this, constantly invokes Spanish and Italian painters in order to associate him with a cosmo himself with a cosmopolitan or international style. There is nothing any longer, in any sense, that the artist is bound to take up on pain of falling outside what is recognized as conforming to the norm. As Hegel says frequently in the lectures, in a way that can sound sometimes like a celebration of postmodernism, for the contemporary artist, anything from the past is available, any style, tradition, technique, theme, or topic, all of this for the first time in the history of art. The extraordinary difficulty of this position, his more historicist one, however, is that we still want to be able to retain the ability, at least I do and I think Hegel does, to say that something can pose as art and even be accepted socially as art, even be purchased as art, and not be art, however historicist Hegel's position. That it can be produced and viewed as art and treated as, as such by the relevant authorities and yet still not be art. For some, doubts, for some, doubts about whether we can make such a claim, whether that makes any sense anymore, began long before Duchamp or Warhol. The question arises for some already with Kandinsky, Malevich, and Mondrian, and for Parisians of the 1860s, for some of it, it arose with Manet. As indicated, though, here we have to read Hegel somewhat against himself, as I'm suggesting, in order ren to render him true to his deepest insights. For whatever form of self-understanding we achieve, we never cease being materially embodied, finite subjects. And so it's hard to understand why some distinctive aesthetic modality of intelligibility, rendering the intelligible of these embodied, material, affective, sensually intelligible beings, even at a historical time, would render art irrelevant or unnecessary, quite the contrary. In the aesthetics lectures, he puts it this way in a striking image that does not seem to lose its force in the later modern world. Spiritual culture, the modern intellect, produces this opposition in man which makes him an amphibious animal because he now has to live in two worlds which contradict one another. The result is that now consciousness wanders about in this contradiction and driven from one side to the other cannot find satisfaction for itself in either the one or the other. It's striking to note that Hegel does not say here that human beings have been and always be, will be such amphibious animals, but as you see, that spiritual culture, the modern intellect, has produced this wandering soul. This claim returns us yet again to a decisive aspect of Hegel's treatment of the so-called problem of the absolute that we've been stressing. The problem our amphibian faces is not a metaphysical problem about substance, how immaterial and material these two worlds, spiritual meaning and 
natural embodied causal interaction could be interactive. We have produced such a being, he says, and so the problem our subject faces is not the proper philosophical account of interacting substances, holomorphism, emergent properties, the nominalist monism, all the philosophical so-called resolutions, but the problem of what he calls satisfaction, the Friedian. How can a subject of thought and deed, which always also experiences itself both as embodied and beyond or more than its material states, come to any resolution about who or what it actually is? How can it find satisfaction in the absence of any such resting place? But Hegel also, repeating in a different register, what I'm <coughs> saying is his <coughs> excuse me, cardinal error, insists that in spite of these amphibian remarks, philosophy, and only philosophy, has succeeded intellectually in overcoming this tension. And it is under that assumption that he ascribes to art the task that leaves so little room for such with any life or interest in it. Against this, we must maintain that art's vocation is to unveil the truth, the true philosophy, philosophy has achieved, of course, in the philosophy of Hegel, in the form of sensuous artistic configuration, to set forth the reconciled opposition just mentioned, and so to have its end and aim in itself in this very setting forth and unveil it. If we change the key word in that quotation to unreconciled and read it again, as by any reasonable account of modernity we have to, a different picture of a possibly modern art opens up. But to appreciate Hegel's possible relevance more concretely, consider again the Manet moment, first in the light of traditional accounts of the beautiful and of art prior to Hegel, and then consider Hegel's very different suggestion. Well, if we just gaze at this painting for a minute, I think it's immediately apparent that philosophical aesthetics from Plato to Kant and even to Schiller is pretty much helpless <coughs> with respect to paintings like these by Manet and eventually by Cezanne and Miro and Picasso and Pollock. Clearly, the tone, both of Manet's original revolutionary paintings, is far from idealizing, as in classicism. If anything, it's anti-idealism, even ironic in its reference to Titian. There is no serious attempt at verisimilitude in the depiction of the, century, the sensual properties. It's not just a corruption of a slideshow, but you're looking at skin that has nothing of Titian's lush, pink, living quality. To many of the observers, when they first saw it, there's no painting like this that paints skin like this. It looks like a mistake. It looks somewhat dirty, even dead. One critic said she looks like a a blown up doll. This is all, of course, well before there were actually uh, uh, blown up dolls. And so there's no invitation to any experience of Schillerian intellectual, sensual harmony. As we'll see with more examples in a moment, the effect is rather something immediately like cognitive or musical dissonance, almost as if both paintings were intended as a kind of affront or insult or at least challenge turned in toto toward the beholder with a strange, flamboyant indifference to that beholder. Um, there's a whole other dimension to this that is explored very well by the British Marxist art historian T.J. Clark in his work on the Olympia. The Olympia is a common pseudonym for a prostitute. And this is clearly a scene of a prostitute welcoming a customer who has arrived with a bouquet of flowers that he's given to the servant. She was bringing them back and around from the back room and the position of the customer is us, is our position. And so Clark is also making the point that Manet is referencing um, the hypocrisy and paradox of prostitution in capitalist society. So the sale of labor power is acceptable as a form of capitalist exchange value, why isn't the sale of the body for sexual purposes? I mean, we pay people to sing for us, we pay for, we pay for them to dance for us, we pay for them to clean for us. The limit of the possibility of exchange value as the only value is being invoked. There's a whole other dimension of this that's also relevant to the Hegelian framework I'm talking about. But in a striking departure from what Michael Fried has called 
the absorptive tradition of the 18th and early 19th century, the subjects in Manet's paintings, as we've seen, look directly out of the picture frame toward the beholder, inviting what we, we, would, we would call theatricality. Here are some examples by contrast of what Freud means by absorption, the technique in which the credibility of the painting is not just posed for us, but real, is established. In uh, Chardin, the absorption in the activities, the indifference to the beholder. This one, everybody's fleeing from the beholder. Uh, in the, uh, Jericho's famous raft of Medusa, the, the kind of um, immersion in work, again, which suggests that they are not here for us, um, which, again, creates the credibility. And then perhaps probably the most dramatic, images of sleep, like this one, which is a self-portrait by Courbet of, of himself, a wounded man. But the uncanny effect of the opposite strategy, facingness, as Freed calls it, is that such beholders, us standing right there in front of the painting, are also as if invisible or at least irrelevant, occupying no important presence in the subject's vacant or bemused look. This suggest suggested absence, and let's put it in Hegelian terms, of even the possibility of mutuality, mutual recognitive status between the subject of the painting and the beholder, suggested by this invisibility or irrelevance, not its simple failure, not just simply misrecognition, and the air of unmistakable unease that this creates is what helps to suggest the incomplete and fragmentary atmosphere in many of the paintings. And well, there are surely examples of great beauty, traditional painterly beauty in Manet's works. Certainly possible for him to paint scenes of just breathtaking beauty, but also bizarre. This is a portrait of a society woman, Mademoiselle D, dressed as a bullfighter in a bullfight. I assure you, there is no convention in French painting in which society women are posed as bullfighters. So great beauty, even in the midst of very unusual mise-en-scene, and a kind of pleasure we take in the sheer boldness of the paintings, those romantic categories, beauty and pleasure and expressiveness, even the whole notion of the beautiful in art, now seem beside the point. But what then would be the point? I'm tempted to rest my whole case for the relevance of Hegel to these considerations in modernism on one passage from the lectures, this one. So conversely, art makes every one of its productions into a thousand-eyed Argos, the traditional guardian monster whereby the inner soul and spirit is seen at every point. And it is not only the bodily form, the look of the eye, the countenance and posture, but also the actions and events, speech, thank you, speech and tones of voice and the series of their course through all conditions of appearance that art has everywhere to make into an eye, which the free soul is where the free soul is revealed in its inner infinity. The idea that visual art can be said to transform the surface of every object, even the appearance of actions or events or speeches and so forth, into a thousand-eyed creature is also a claim that the reception and appreciation of the work should be understood not as an inspiring intimation of the ideal, nor as the occasion of an unusual harmony or unusual disinterested pleasure. After all, even when we are confronted by a two-eyed creature, the task of figuring out what is revealed in someone's eyes is obviously not straightforward. It can be much more difficult even than understanding what they say. A response appropriate to the ambition of the work then must be an interpretive accomplishment of some sort, one that begins in some interrogative, not merely centrally receptive or contemplative relation to the object. A feature of the aesthetic experience, Hegel suggests, is spectacularly more difficult than appreciated by imagining that an artwork, as opposed to a human being, has a thousand eyes. Early on, Hegel had characterized all of art in a way that can sound like boilerplate, unless we understand how unusual the formulation is. Quote, it, the work, is essentially, essentially a question, an address to the responsive breast 
a call to the mind and the spirit, unquote. Such an attempt must be responsive to evidence and interpretation, but is never settleable by any fact of the matter, can always remain open and contentious, one of the key features of modernism. Moreover, the image itself suggests that we think of the difference between seeing a painted surface in an artwork and seeing the object itself as very like the difference between seeing a person or a person's face as a physical object like any other and seeing it as the face of a person, requiring a completely different relation between beholder and beheld. This also suggests that there's a deep connection between understanding meaningful conduct, actions in the public world, and expressions of persons, and understanding expressive meanings in artworks as well. And this all suggests something more determinate about the distinct category of essential and especially visual intelligibility that Hegel has tried to differentiate from what he calls the representative, which he attributes to religion, and the conceptual intelligibility in philosophy. Such a form of discrimination, obviously of great relevance to pictorial intelligibility, is certainly not or cannot be wholly non-conceptual in Hegel's account or a mere material effect, <coughs> but the modality of its less determinate conceptual determinacy addresses the beholder in a unique and, as he says, interrogative way. Perhaps one way of understanding Hegel's point is to call to mind a feature of social interaction quite prominent, interestingly, in many modernist novels, its suggestion that there is a unique form of visual intelligibility in the human face. In Proust's novel, Swan, we are told several times, can see in Odette's face that she's lying about an assignation. He doesn't see some evidence on the basis of which he makes an inference. He is said to see the lie in her face. And we have to keep that in mind, I think, in looking at the Olympia. Or in a conversation in a Henry James novel, to be even more complicated, a character A can see in the face of another character B, not only that B knows that A has revealed some confidence he shouldn't, but that B now knows that A knows that B knows. And all of this can occur in an instant, not inferentially, but visually. And again, Whatever this form of intelligibility is, it is not inferential and in some literal sense seen and is at work when a painting arrests us, compels our attention, and raises the kind of question Hegel has noted. That is, as Hegel understands it, the making and especially the displaying of artworks to the public cannot but express an underlying assumption about the possibility of some public meaning and so involves an assumption about the status and role of the beholder, any putative addressee of such expression of meaning. This assumption would have to be congruent with assumptions active at the time in society about agency, a possibly public meaning embodied in bodily movements and words, and about those for whom such a display is intended, at least on the assumption that such a performative and public dimension is at the heart of Hegel's account of subjectivity and agency, which I think it is. And given the way Hegel approaches such questions, we have to say that he means the satisfaction of these aesthetic and performative conditions again at a time, that is, in our time, under the conditions of modernity. If this is a feature of art as such, especially visual art, but all sensual and effective re reactions to an, an attempt at intelligible interaction, then it might also be said that under some historical conditions, the capacity to fulfill these requirements in both its manifestations, social and aesthetic, basically our capacity to understand each other, could come to be experienced It's not working? Now, I'm sorry, I thought, you were, I thought you were hearing me fine. Now you can hear me fine. Shall I start all over again? <laughs> oh, it's for the recording. Okay, I thought this was working. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> than ever before, a new relation that is more an aspiration than a confident presentment. Then something like the resistance of modernist art 
to conventional appreciation and interpretation. The unfamiliarity and opacity we often see in its thousand eyes can be understood as something like the culmination of this new difficulty, now made much more explicitly self-conscious and insistent, and so is responsive to altered conditions of such public intelligibility. The same could be said, mutatis mutandis, for the aspirations of much of modernism to forge, as it became more explicitly political, to form a new and revolutionary understanding of these conditions, to demand that we understand each other and thereby understand and appreciate art in some new way. This is the Hegelian link I want to insist we should retain in an aesthetic theory of modernism, even if we abandon Hegel's historical triumphalism about bourgeois society. And again, to make this point in a more literal rather than figurative sense, where else is the beholder's eyes drawn in the two Manet paintings than to the face and expressions of the two naked women? Both expressions seem opaque to and um, somewhat, even somewhat contemptuous of the uh, beholder's own gaze, raising the stakes considerably in trying to answer just what is expressed in their face and eyes. This sort of question is particularly important in Manet because there's so often an air of mystery and opacity in the expressions of his subjects in many, many different contexts and in the unusual settings, a challenge that resists direct, immediate understanding, as if designed to prevent now inappropriate conventional readings. Some of these Manet looks are, of course, quite famous, as famous as these two, like the fatigue and especially the vacancy um, in the expression of the girl in the bar at the Folies Bergère. But these eyes are everywhere in